everybody? How many of you are here with your mothers? No one, not surprising at all. Uh, good evening, my name is Gray Drake. I'm the senior editor of Rotten Tomatoes, and I am so pleased to stand in front of you tonight. Oh, when the... When my mic comes back on, I'll be able to speak at a normal volume, but instead, why don't you? Is this? Sorry about that. Here you go. Oh. Don't give anyone that mic. Keep the applause going, and let's please welcome out our guests. Director Luca Guadagnino, screenwriter David Kajanic, and stars Mia Goff, Dakota Johnson, Sylvia Swinton, and Jessica Harper. All right, so Luca, can you please begin, for anyone who doesn't know, by explaining your long relationship to Suspiria? Well, I think it's... Hello? Yep. Please, something that many fans of Dallas still share with me. It's, I think I see when I was very young, and it made an impression that lasted till now. And I couldn't really overcome that impression to the degree that I had to make the move. To the degree that I had to make it into my own version of it. And I, had, I had read that there was just a poster. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was a, <laughs> it was a poster hanging on a cinema in Cesenatico, in the north of Italy, in the Adriatic coast. And uh, it was the very famous poster that the gentleman over there has parked on his t shirt. Why he's filming it on the left side? <laughs> uh, famous, beautiful poster, yeah. I was considering something making that deep an impression on you that it stayed with you this long and you were able to turn it into your job, essentially. And so I wanted to open up by way of going down the line and asking you all if there was something that you saw, if it was, you know, for me it would have been a VHS cover of. Prom night two, <laughs> that you just couldn't get out of your head, or a poster, or something that really affected your memory. Mine is the birds. I, I feel like I ate that movie when I was young, and it's been in my cells ever since. Um, the first, uh, that's a tricky question, but the first movie that comes to my mind is The Shining. That's one of my favorite films of all time. I saw it when I was far too young. Um, and it just really left me really disturbed, but I loved it too. It's hard to forget. Can we go now? Oh, no. You can share this technology. I still have them here. Um, is it, was the question just our favorite films or favorite horror films? I had something that just kind of jammed itself in your memory. Oh, yeah. Home Alone. <laughs> um, and also The Princess Bride. Yeah. And also so many other ones. Um, I thought about the same Hobie Rods again. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I remember very clearly the first film I ever saw, um, which for very long I thought was a dream. And I kept asking people if they'd seen this movie and they'd never seen it. Finally, I discovered what it was, and you can see it on YouTube right now. Um, it is this extraordinary film called Powers of Ten by Charles and Ray Eames. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's where it, it was made for, for the NASA project. And you go down onto a couple on a, on a, on a blanket having a picnic, and you go out and you see that they're in America, and you go out and you see they're in the world, and you go out into the universe ten times, and then you come back down, and you, and you go onto the man's hand, and you go into his blood, and you go into the, the atoms. And it's the truthiest thing you will ever see. And I saw that when I was eight. And for about 30 years, I thought I was the only person who had ever seen it. Um, so yeah, that jammed. And uh, it's worth jamming into an eight-year-old's brain. Uh, mine was a five-year-old um, 
experience, which was um, The Wizard of Oz, which terrified me. It was my first horror movie, I feel. It terrified me and stayed to this day. Dun, 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 dun. The monkey, the monkey game, you are familiar with that? Still haunts me. Anyway, yeah, that's my work. Uh, anyway. Please hang on to the microphone because you are our link to the original film. And I want, right? And so I think that a lot of people in the audience might be able to relate to my response when I first heard this was being remade, and I went, oh, that's a tall order. And what was your response when you first got wind of it? Oh, I thought, I thought it was a tall order, but that was, you know, there were many, many rumors that floated around for years, as some of you may know about a remake with various names attached to the project. And I, in each case, I thought that's a tall order and it can't possibly. And then I heard that Luca was attached and I thought, yes! <laughs> now, that's a possibility. That's gonna be incredibly interesting. Luca and Dave, can you talk about how you integrated, essentially, I, so many new ideas into this version to really turn it into its own thing, especially referencing you know, so many things like Freud, for instance, it's not something that I got out of the original, necessarily. Well, I think our decision to keep it in 1977 uh, was instrumental in affording us a whole different um, context for it, a much wider context for it. So it wasn't going to be all hermetically sealed inside of that gas company. And if you think about what was happening in Berlin in 1977, so many things were being unpacked. Um, and that might even be too coy a word. So many things were being ripped out of the luggage of the national identity at the time in Germany. And so we thought it would be interesting to juxtapose a uh, kind of examination of the politics inside of that coven with the counterpoint of the ambiguity of the political action going on around Berlin at the time. Anyone could point to something and, and from one angle call it terrorism, from another angle call it political action. Um, and so that was really useful for us, that ambiguity. Well, well uh, as Dave said, 1977 was really the interesting storm here because of the, I, for me, the iconicity of the year because of Dyson versus Suspiria. And because we grew up uh, loving the cinema that came out of our Germany at the time, <coughs> which was a very important uh, wave that was uh, really leading the way to a, a, new, a new form for this language of cinema, at the same time, a reflection on what was happening in, in the society then. So we thought about this uh, strange child born from Darius Gentle and Francisca. That served as a fascinating backdrop, but on top of it, the dance itself was part of the horror for me. And I, I've never responded that way to seeing contemporary dance before. And, one of the questions in the movie that I wanted to ask you, Dakota and Mia, it's lifted right from the movie. What does it feel like inside your body to dance the way that you were dancing in the film? Um, I've never danced before. I had no um, training. I, I always felt quite um, uncomfortable. Um, and just quite awkward. And through learning this dance and going into training every day and being the choreographer and all the wonderful dancers, it was incredibly empowering because the dance in and of itself is, is not sexy at all. There's something very, um, it's, it's very raw and, and, and primal and I, 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 yeah, I, I, um, I felt really gifted in it. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I felt similarly. I, I danced when I was little, but I did ballet, which is, you know, clearly meant to be so beautiful and look painless when it is so painful. And this dance, this style of dance is meant to convey pain and anger and sorrow and frustration and um, 
this sort of feeling of being deeply unsettled and distraught and um, and it felt like I had to kind of erase all of my prior knowledge of dance of going against gravity to make things look beautiful and letting my body be sharp and sort of um, like uh, not aggressive in a way um, and it felt I think you have a, a wider sense of awareness when you are so when you spend so much time every day so aware of your body and I learned a lot of that through the dancers we worked with as well because they you know the, the traveling lifestyle of a dancer is not very glamorous and it's really hard and and the hours are so intense and you the work on your body is so intense, but these women, they've done it their whole lives because it's, they just have to move their bodies. They have to, it's like breathing for them. And I found that to be so beautiful and, and I found that to be very helpful in terms of how Susie dances. It felt disorienting for me to watch because it is something so beautiful that requires so much skill, but it was presented with such brutality. It's like the sound design, the editing, everything that created it, including, you know, with the movement. I was like, oh my God, these girls must be so banged up, right? Like, it just seemed crazy. We were pretty breezy. Yeah, okay. Because uh, if you weren't, I would be very genuinely surprised. And even the movement of your character, Tilda, the, I, there, there are a couple of quick shots and dream sequences where I see you dancing, uh, and I felt like that movement really carried into your character, but just in case people out there aren't entirely sure how many characters you played in the film, could you please list them? <laughs> <laughs> well, what does it say on the poster? I think uh, playing <laughs> Um, back to the dance. Um, <laughs> the, the thing you have to realize is that the, the dance that's designed for the film, uh, which is designed by Daniel Charlet, who's our extraordinary Belgian choreographer, he did this very, I and mean, he's in his own right an amazing choreographer, a modern choreographer, but he, as it were, designed dance, choreographed in character because he was designing dance for 1927 that really came out of this resistance to, frankly, what the Nazis put in place. I mean, there was a quote that for a very long time was on a cut of the, of the film, and several cuts of the film, which was a, a, a quote from Goebbels, which said, I think, if you can remind me, it said something like, dance can only be ever cheerful and beautiful and never intellectual. And for a long time, this was on the cut of the film. And finally, as these things happened, didn't, didn't end up. But what the trace of that quote is in the moment when Madame Blanc says to Susie, um, the two things that dance can never be ever again are cheerful and beautiful. We have to break the nose of every beautiful thing. That's what that dance is that he has he's designed for us. And it's, yeah, it's, it's hardcore. <laughs> True. It's really cross. It's really angry. And it's really um, sort of the inner, it's sort of you take beauty and elegance and the, the idea of some kind of uh, external idea of what the feminine is, and you just turn it right inside out and, 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 and go for the gullet. And therefore kind of expressing all the different sides of femininity at the same time. And there, in seeing the film more than once, I really appreciated just the smallest flick of your hand as you were walking away from the girls. Can I ask you to break down how you prepare for a role? I know you're giving me that face, but I want to know. I want to know nuts and bolts because it, the the characters that you come up with are all so vivid in different ways. Wow, um, sorry about the face. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the real answer to how how to prepare is to talk to Luca for 25 years about this film. Um, and to have the luxury of that kind of uh, lazy pre-production, as they call it in professional circles, um, where you just figure out what all your what all your 
resonances and all your influences might be. I mean, one of my influences, I have to say, and I'm being quite, quite out there about this because I want everybody that don't understand it to go and see the film, is the great uh, Lermontov, which is the great character played by Anton Lerbrook, uh, Warbrook in The Red Shoes by uh, Paolo Pressburger. He's this extraordinary, charismatic dance choreographer uh, who has an intimate uh, sort of Svengali relationship with a redhead dancer. And that, and he, you see that film if you haven't seen it already, you'll understand why I'm saying this. He's sort of innate, the feeling of a choreographer who can't dance anymore, or doesn't dance. And she sort of still dances, but you sense that she needs these dancers so badly. They're her, you know, they're her avatars. That, the feeling of the tension in these kinds of gestures, that, that, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but these sorts of little, you know, Peccadillas, these sorts of little noodles uh, over 25 years, that's where that would come from. I know you guys have a lot of questions out there. Okay, so I see one right in the front. Uh, hi, uh, this is my uh, third time watching this film. Uh, and uh, so so I didn't know that uh, the doctor was also played by Tilda and Tilda after the second time I watched it. Uh, so I'm just uh, wondering uh, what are the uh, everything about uh, that decision and including uh, during which stage uh, during the writing or casting that decision was made? Well, it's a good sentence of um, <laughs> from Professor from, 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 uh, the, the I think everything was very, not very big, it flew, 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 it flew. Uh, Bottom line, it was a great opportunity of playgroundless fun, let's say. Thank you. Right there. Hello. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Ben Magnus. I'm a USC art student. I have a question for Mr. Blog. Do you have a the film? Uh, it sort of really follows these broad themes, but they're kind of more of a brighter note and stick to the color palette. So when you were approaching directing the film, how did you kind of strike the balance Um, well, a great movie is, uh, if, even a more realistic movie for me, is of, of course uh, a dream, uh, some sort of uh, fairy tale, even, even a Ken Loach movie is for me. Um, in this case, I think the guidelines came from the, the world we were building, this world of 1977 Germany, um, the reference we had, particularly the scene of the finger and the picture, the painting of Altus. So I think that that plan, it just opposed to a very precise search for the details of the everyday practicalities of the life of these characters, possibly led to what you call this stylized, imperceptible. the movie. All you did so amazing. Um, can you tell us anything about your next project? And, um, it's a big volume in my next project. <laughs> what? The long volume in my next project. Oh, okay. Can you tell us anything about your name's equal? Oh, no, no, no. That's something that is not the deadline for today. Well, the soundtrack uh, had to be very 
talk of blowing the tide in this case because of the great legacy of the Goblin soundtrack from Venice Film, and uh, which is amazing, of course. And um, but it couldn't be imitating it, couldn't be quoting it in a let's say direct way. And uh, and I started to think of uh, what was the musical voice of my generation, and I immediately thought about uh, uh, Tommy Rock. And that's how uh, the idea came about. And then we approached him, thanks to our, also my music supervisor, Robbie Bergman. And after a few attempts, so we finally got together with Tom and we spoke about it. We spoke about the fact that we want the music to be a cat in itself. We didn't want the soundtrack to uh, create a, an atmosphere of, of spookiness for the sake of it. We preferred the idea that the soundtrack was somehow and off of both the world of Madame Blanc company and <coughs> from the world of the movie at large. And also we wanted the music to always rely on to the, the music and the instruments up until 1977. Uh, back there? Yeah. <laughs> one, one, one of you. <laughs> You mean the, the Black Sabbath, the ritual, yes. I, I think it was five days, and it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you can do one more. Uh, can you talk about the decision to change Susie's character from a proverbial innocent in the original to uh, basically a new witch mother in this one? Well, because of what you just said, the proverbial innocent was not very interesting. And I think the baby said, I beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you were fantastic in the movie. In the context of a proverbial innocent. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what was a proverbial innocent? You weren't. I wasn't as innocent as I appeared. You're smiling at the end of the original. Yeah, that wasn't an innocent. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, we talked about wanting to, to try to, to flip. Uh, you know, an audience's expectations in the sense that here's a mystery about the original as to what really is going on. We knew we were going to dismantle that pretty quickly, and so it felt like if this was going to be a film that in some way was about Susie's uh, empowerment, finding her true identity, it seemed um, like it was the most interesting choice to drive her towards something that was so ambiguous as opposed to having another horror film where the final girl is just the object of the horror for a few minutes, or in this case, well, more. We wanted Susie to be the subject of the horror at some points in the film, um, so we could kind of have our cake and eat it too. Can you steal that microphone? Yeah. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for tonight, so please give it a hand for all the audience. If you wouldn't mind staying seated, I do have something very important to tell you. As you all know, social media is critical uh, these days to a wonderful film like this. So please make sure that you spread the word, call your friends, but also tweet them and do Instagram and all that nonsense, wonderful stuff. Uh, because it is important and opening weekends are super important. You've already done your part and please help your friends experience the magic of the bloodbath. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Have a great night.